Hey, good morning, Calvary, and thanks for being part of today's online service. We appreciate your engagement in this way. We hope you and your family had a great Easter weekend last week, and uh, you, like all of us, are waiting for spring to turn up the temperature a little bit and get rid of this snow and ice. Well, today we're coming back to Mark's Gospel, Chapter 2. Our series has been called Good News for Tough Times. And if you have a Bible, go ahead and find the Gospel of Mark, Chapter 2. We're starting at verse 13 today. Uh, my hope for today is that we'd see ourselves and other people the way Jesus does and see what it is that he wants to do in, with, and through us. So <clears throat> Mark 2, verse 13, join me. Then Jesus went out to the lake shore again and taught the crowds <clears throat> that were coming to him. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. <coughs> Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of religious law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Let's pray. Lord God, today we come to you uh, needing a word of hope, needing your word to be bread for our soul, and wanting to know how you see people and how you see us. Uh, you know the temptations we face and the burdens that we carry, Lord. And today we want to lay them down at your feet and just get a look at life through Jesus' eyes. Let him show us your heart. Lord God, we continue to pray for the nation of Ukraine in the midst of this terrible war. Uh, Lord God, we pray for uh, refugees and those who have mourned the loss of loved ones, for your protection and encouragement and strength in their lives, Lord, for your power to be at work through your church, to give people the hope of Jesus. And Lord God, we pray for all government leaders involved in all the neighboring countries as well, Lord God, that you would be at work in them as they make really important decisions this week. Lord God, now would you speak to us as we come to your word. May uh, my words, Lord, be led by you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So Jesus attracted disreputable people and became disreputable himself. And if you hang out with followers of Jesus very long, you might find some disreputable people as yourself, and you probably are one in different ways. Uh, many years ago, I was serving another church in another town. Funeral director called me up. He needed a pastor for a family funeral, and the family had no church connections. The older man of the home had passed away. There was a widow and an adult son and an adult daughter. The funeral director needed help, but he kept giving me options to turn him down. He almost seemed to be steering me away. He used words to describe the family as rough crowd, other side of the tracks, not church folk, kind of scary. Uh, well, the fellow who died and his wife, I'll call him Pa and Ma, were over-the-road truck drivers. And Ma went through more Copenhagen than your average pro baseball player. Daughter and son ran a dive bar. The daughter had a big grin and a big laugh. <clears throat> and the son, Harv, he was a big guy. And if you ran into him in the dark, you probably would be kind of scared. Turned out <clears throat> he was a gentle giant. Turned out he told me he liked to watch preachers on TV and asked me what I thought of him. Because he said he couldn't go to church because he didn't have any of the right clothes. Well, months later, <clears throat> there was a granddaughter in the family who wanted to go to camp. And so one spring day, I'm walking down the street, heading to the bar to meet with the family. And as I go up to the door, Rod drives by. 
Rod is our church insurance agent. And he was an upstanding member of the community and another local church. And there was a little voice in my head that said, what will people think? What will people think if they see you going in here? What will people think if they see a meeting with Harv and Pam? Well, Rod was not the problem. He was a good guy. And Harvey wasn't the problem, and neither was Pam. The problem was the voice of a little Pharisee that wants to live in my head. That was the big problem. Somebody who tells me to look out for my reputation and make sure that you look good in the eyes of other people. Jesus, on the other hand, tended to attract the disreputable. And he became disreputable in the process. If you read through this section of Mark, you see he's constantly being confronted by the religious leaders in his community. And they are doubting his teaching and his actions and especially his crowd. So we're going to look around this house party and see who's on the inside and who's on the outside. Inside we find Levi, the tax collector, and his sinner friends. We also know him as Matthew. We don't know why he had two names. It could be that like Peter, Jesus gave him a new name. Being a tax collector was as disreputable as you could get. He collected taxes along a busy highway, working for a politician named Herod. And Herod worked as a local representative of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was an oppressive regime that overburdened people with taxes. <coughs> now, Romans didn't pay tax collectors a salary. They would auction off the rights to collect taxes in a region. And they simply figured that if you weren't crafty enough to cheat and threaten people out of enough money to make a good living, well, then you were in the wrong business. You could picture uh, Levi as a guy who probably has to pay for security. And he's the guy that nobody is going to have over to their house and nobody is going to go to his house. Picture a guy with the power of government, the scruples of the mob, and the reputation of a traitor. Normal people don't socialize with these kind of people. They don't invite them to lunch. They certainly don't marry into their family. <clears throat> these were people who were outcasts because they'd turned their back on their people and their faith. The Jews called them dogs. And the Romans called them worse. And yet Mark says that there were many people like this around Jesus. And that he went into his house and they were having a meal together. And a meal signified friendship and acceptance. Well, Jesus' reputation was instantly called into question. You can imagine news like this would travel like wildfire through that town. And who's calling him into question? The people who are on the outside of the house party looking in with pointy fingers and accusations. The Pharisees, the scribes, the religion experts and the spiritual overachievers, those were the folks staying on the outside. Now, if you're prone to thinking of Pharisees as bad guys and villains, you need to know that in their time and place, they were looked on as pillars in the community, role models, leaders. See, for 300 years, foreigners had been dominating Israel. And within Israel, there was a constant tension of how do you relate to these pagan outsiders? First came the Greeks, and then came the Romans, and guys like Herod and the Sadducees only stayed in power because they accommodated. They were willing to come to terms with the foreign oppressors. Other groups wanted to fight them with violence. But what the Pharisees were known for is taking a moral stand to resist the outside influence and to try and steer Israel in the direction of greater devotion to God. Their ancestors had fought wars. Some of them had been martyred for their faith. They were doing what they could to rid Israel of paganizing trends and accommodating leaders. They were a brotherhood of the devout, the committed, the zealous. They were the Bible scholars, disciplined in spiritual practices, meticulous in application. 
They were known as the specifiers. They would give you all the specifics of how to apply the Bible to your life in a way that would please God. And let and they let it be known that if you didn't follow their specifics, you were out of bounds. But their system left ordinary Jews in the dust outside the club. You could think of them as looking at society as layers of ungodliness to godliness. And you can guess who is at the top of the pyramid. <clears throat> well, the NIV says that their question was, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? That's a literal translation. The New Living Translation puts it this way. Why does he eat with such scum? That drives at the spirit of what they were asking. You see, when they use the term sinners, they weren't just using it in a generic sense of God has a law, we've all broken it, and we've all needed forgiveness. No, they were using it in an accusatory sense. Those are the bad people in contrast to us who are the good people. We are in the wrong, right. They are always in the wrong. Why would God, or rather, why would Jesus associate with such disreputable people? It could only stain his reputation and it could only reveal what he is really like. The name Pharisees <clears throat> meant separated ones. Separated from anything that contaminates you. Separated from people who don't measure up to your holiness. Separation was at the core of their whole approach to walking with God. And it was at the core of their whole approach to living in society. Separate yourselves from others. Keep a distance. Keep the fences up and the gates closed. Be careful who you spend time with. And do not associate with people who are not as committed, clean, and convic convicted as you are. So <clears throat> you have tax collectors and scum in the house. You have religious high achievers and religion experts outside the house. And in the middle of the table, you have the guy who started this whole mess. Because remember here, Jesus took the initiative and he chose to do it in a very public way. He was teaching crowds at the lakeshore. He's walking down the road. You can picture a lot of people with him. And he publicly calls Matthew to follow him. And amazingly, Levi Matthew responds. And then he not only calls Levi to become a follower, but he actually sits down in Levi's house with all of his tax collector sinner friends. Why? Why would he do such a thing? It went completely against all the norms of their society and particularly the religious people of his day. Jesus put it this way. <clears throat> Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. He said, I have come not to call those who think they are righteous, but those who know they're sinners. Friends, that pretty much sums it up. That's why we're still here the week after Easter, and that's why we're still here 2,000 years after the cross, because Jesus is still building a fellowship centered around his leadership that is changing people's lives now and for eternity. He's not here just to do lectures for the learned. He is not here to be the commander of religious commandos. This is not an elitist club. This is a place where the door is open to tax collectors and sinners. He is a doctor for the sick, not just the sick in the body, but the sick in the soul, the sick in the spirit. He can do anything with our bodies, but he needs to do something with our sick soul, with the cancerous spirit that we have. You see, there is a soul cancer that self-help doesn't help at all. There is a soul cancer <clears throat> that's not changed by rituals or running with the right crowd or your discipline or commitment or zeal. Jesus doesn't ignore their past, but he doesn't believe that the past has to define their future. Jesus doesn't condone what Levi has done, but Jesus believes that he can do something about it. Jesus believes that Levi could stand up and enter into a relationship with Jesus of discipleship, learning a new way to live, trusting him, being loved by him. It could change Levi forever.
and Levi did. <coughs> Levi didn't initiate this relationship. Jesus did. Jesus was the one who gave the invite. Jesus was the one who met him on the street. And Jesus was the one who was willing to go to his house. Levi got up and followed. And Levi got changed in the process forever. <coughs> That's the essence of being a disciple. Trusting yourself to the loving leadership of Jesus. Getting to know him in a way that he changes you. Someone has said that fishermen could always go back to their boats, but a tax collector could never go back to his booth. Once Levi saw in Jesus something that he wanted more than a bigger paycheck, he didn't look back. So that's what we're here for as a church. That's what being a follower of Jesus is all about. Our vision is to glorify God by following Jesus together. We enter into a personal relationship with him, but we enter into a public relationship with others who are following him as well. So we break it down into three parts, invite, engage, and equip. We invite people to get to know Jesus and follow and trust him. We engage people in relationship around Jesus so that we learn how to live life his way. And then we're equipped by Jesus to serve God in our community. All you have to do to get started is acknowledge your need. Jesus didn't say to Levi, boy, your resume is terrible. Go on an apprenticeship for a couple of years and come back and apply. Uh, there was another group of uh, religious uh, community in Israel at the time called Essenes, and they would put applicants on a two-year probationary period to see if they shook out first. Not Jesus. He stood in front of Levi and said, come follow me, and Levi did. And the next thing you know, they were having dinner together no matter what the community thought. <clears throat> Folks, this door is wide open to people who are reputable and disreputable. But it's also a warning to anyone who thinks that they're just morally fine without Jesus and can do it on their own. People who have no need people who have the world ranked and measured up and they're doing just fine at the top of the pyramid, they find it hard to be interested in Jesus' command. It's a lot easier to trust a doctor when you know you have a need. <clears throat> so we keep a first aid kit around the building because uh, you never know when you're going to need it. Um, we've had Sunday mornings when people pass out and need an ambulance. Uh, if you do kids and youth ministry, you're definitely going to need one of these sooner or later because kids run into things like each other and walls. Uh, I remember the kid who ran his sled into a tree. Uh, that one was an ambulance day. I remember the kid we had on a canoe trip, and he jumped up and down on the picnic table and found out there was a hornet's nest underneath. We were glad we had a kit. I remember the girl who bonked her face broke off her tooth and had to go to the dentist immediately. I remember the day I was out in the yard watching kids at the end of release time. And of course, we only had two minutes left until the buses showed up to take them back to school. And that's when two girls collided head on, fell to the ground crying in blood. I think that one might have been stitches. And then there was Tony. <clears throat> now Tony was a long time ago, before cell phones. And we were on a trip with students in Wisconsin. And Tony was a high school diver, and he dove off a six-foot railing into three foot of water. And I'll just tell you, it was bad. It was scary bad. And there was no phone to call for help. All we could do is load him on the bus, catch a ferry boat off Madeline Island, and get him to the hospital as soon as we could. But you know what? The doctors knew what to do. And Tony was back home in a few days. And we were very grateful. Folks, Jesus knows what to do with the soul cancer that we have. He knows what to do with the sin disease that is 100% fatal in our spirit. He knows what he's capable of. He is the cure. And he is looking for you. And he wants you to follow him. He wants you to get to know him. He wants you to learn how to live life his way a change of direction, a change of destiny, a change of relationship with God. 
The Pharisees were afraid that sin was contagious. Well, Jesus has a cure for that, and it's called grace, and it's very contagious. Jesus knows that he has a cure that we need, his forgiveness, his mercy, his grace, his kindness, his leadership, his love. Friends, if you have never entrusted yourself to the care of Jesus, he is the prescription that we need. And he would love for you to trust him today and become his follower. And it doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter where you rank in the community or what your reputation might have been. He loves you enough to come after you. And I'm just asking today that if you've never trusted him before, Today, do you know you have a sickness inside that Jesus is a cure? And would you entrust yourself to him by faith? If you're ready to do that today for the first time or maybe as an act of recommitment, would you bow your head and pray with me right where you're at? Lord Jesus, I need you. I know I have sinned against God and hurt myself and others. Please forgive me. Please wash me clean. I want your grace. I want your leadership in my life. I want to follow you by faith. Lord Jesus, be my doctor. I entrust myself to your care. Amen. <clears throat> Friend, if you did that today as first time or as an act of recommitment, would you let somebody know? Family that you're with, close friend, contact the church through our website or stop in. We would love to encourage you in your relationship with God and engage with you as you seek to grow. Thanks for being part of today's service. We're going to close with a song. And uh, thank you for your encouragement to us in this ministry. Amen.